Uh, welcome everybody again to the third installment of the webinar series. This one's called Exploring Soil Health in the Lower Embudo Valley, Lower Embudo Watershed. This one should be really exciting. Jan Velm was talking to me about it yesterday and I think that all of us who have gardens and farms and even those of us who don't will really find the information invigorating and um, hopefully stimulate a lot of questions and thoughts. So I'll do the quick uh, intro of how to work with Zoom and it's probably a lot like when you're on a plane where the stewardess comes on and you can ignore her <laughs> if you already know, but I'm going to go ahead and do that. So if you can uh, change the slide, please, Jan Willem. There we go. So we'll have a PowerPoint just like the other uh, webinars and Jan Willem is on with us. He won't have his face shown. It's just the easiest way to do it. You'll hear his voice. I will keep my face up on the Zoom meeting just so you have a face to associate with what's going on. And we ask that everyone puts their microphones on mute. You can find that at the bottom of your screen. You can see this first uh, mute button that's circled. And that just helps us to keep him clear and the slides moving forward. If you're on a phone, you can do that by star six. That'll mute and unmute you. At about halfway through, we're gonna have a question and answer session. And if you can just keep your questions typed in the chat box, uh, that looks like it's about the fifth or sixth button over the chat and you make it to everyone. So if um, you have questions, you can type them in there. And if right now, if we could take a moment and just put in our name and maybe if we're with an organization or if we're a farmer or gardener, and then if people watch or you wanna exchange contact information, um, you can do that. So let's just test out our chat boxes. I'll put mine in first. There we go. Um, and let's see, this webinar will be recorded. So if you have any issues with your voice or with your, um, it, with anything pertaining to your face, let, let me know and we'll figure out something. Um, I, I forgot to finish my sentence, which is you We'll be typing in your questions throughout the webinar and at the halfway point we'll have about a 10 minute question and answer where I'll be relaying the questions off the chat box to Jan Willem. And then at the end of the webinar, we will be doing just a short little, I'll finish up those chat box questions and then you could actually um, unmute yourself uh, when indicated and then ask him questions. So you can verbally communicate with the group and with him. And we've made sure this time to leave a good amount for questions. So we will uh, be a timely group, I hope. Okay, let's see, what else? Um, if you need anything as far as tech support, this number you'll see 505-393-1355 is Leah. She's from Kavir Coalition, so she'll be on the line if you need any help. Um, she's been a great help and a, a great partner in this all. So give her a call if you have any technical problems. And I believe that's about it. Yes, that's, that's it. So I'm going to turn it over to Jan Willem and let him talk about himself and what's going on with this series and this particular installment. And thank you all for coming and uh, look forward to the thought provoking question and answers. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Adrian. And welcome everybody. It's good to um, have a good crowd again uh, and see some um, familiar names here on the, on the list of participants. Um, I'm very excited about uh, what we're going to talk about today. Um, uh, for those who don't know me, I want to introduce myself. My name is Jan Willem Janssen. Um, I own the company Ecotone Landscape Planning in Santa Fe. Uh, I've been here in northern New Mexico for 27 years. Um, I come to this topic and to this area uh, as a landscape planner and ecological res restoration planner. My expertise is in watershed management planning and ecological restoration. 
And I have a degree in agricultural sciences and a specialization in landscape architecture and landscape planning. I've been working in the Lower Embudo Valley for about 10 years on watershed planning, woodland restoration, and soil and water conservation. And soil health has been an interest of mine throughout my career and as a part of my work on land health and community well being uh, throughout northern New Mexico. And actually, I work pretty much throughout the country, actually. Uh, I'm very excited to share from my insights and expertise and experience. Uh, but what you'll see today is that I only can speak towards this topic as a planner. And there is a lot of farming and other experience necessary to really figure out what we're doing here in terms of soil health on sediment and alluvial fans. So I hope you'll chime in with questions and suggestions and, and comments that we can make this as interactive as possible. Um, in comparison with the previous uh, webinars, I've cut about 25% of the slides so we will have uh, less images and maybe more time to talk. So in these webinars, uh, like any of the other ones and the next one uh, in two weeks, I introduced the critical importance of soil in holding water and as the natural growing medium for plants and many other forms of life and explain the self-generating and self-healing capacity of the soil uh, and that those capacities are especially uh, coming forward if the soil has not been overstressed. If it's overly stressed or if it's actually very sterile, like much sediment, like we talk about today, then those self-healing and self-generating capacities are much more challenging. Um, so we're building on the previous two webinars and look in more detail at how we might deal with soil improvement of sedimentary material that flows onto fields from arroyos in the landscape. And besides looking at uh, erosion problems as we did uh, two weeks ago, uh, we'll have to figure out what to do on soils that lack structure and organic matter. And again, as I said, that's a pretty big challenge for a lot of areas in New Mexico and beyond. Um, the case study area in Embudo, uh, in the Embudo Valley, serves to provide some insights that have a wider applicability throughout the dryland west of the United States. I want to thank a couple people because this webinar series is supported by the New Mexico Department of Agriculture's uh, Healthy Soil Program. Uh, that was uh, started with the Healthy Soil Act of 2019. Uh, I want to thank the Embudo Valley Library and Community Center for being the fiscal sponsor and anchor for this program in, in Dixon. The Prevera Coalition uh, for helping with uh, the technical presentation uh, in the form of this webinar. And then Adrian, thank you again for moderating uh, this entire program. So here you see my face. Uh, some technicalities uh, prevent me from being on the screen and it would probably distract uh, also. So that's why we've chosen to just do it in this format. So the purpose um, of this webinar series is to explore and explain and like we've, uh, like you can see here on this slide, we've begun uh, three weeks ago with defining uh, what soil really is and what healthy soil might mean. Uh, then we went on to talking two weeks ago about the restoration of soil, especially in degraded areas, um, for instance, in the areas degraded by heavy intensive use, for instance, uh, from off-road vehicles, from um, uh, park landscapes and uh, anything that degrades the soil and removes the topsoil. Now, today we're going to look at how to restore the soil um, in areas that are affected by sediment, the sediment caused by the erosion that we talked about two weeks ago. And in two weeks, we're going to talk more about how you maintain soil health in fields with native soil, with native clay and loam soils that are not so affected by sediment or erosion. But because of farming, you still have to 
in Tango soil. In all these webinars, we're looking at indicators of land and soil health below ground and above ground, and how plants are connected through fungal networks, and how the soil microbiome accumulates carbon, and how we store water, and how this is all connected and working together. We're also looking at the impacts of erosion and sedimentation, like I mentioned, uh, what other common soil health problems are, like that it's too acidic or to alkaline uh, or that it lacks organic matter and what we can do about them. And in that context, we come back all the time at, to the five soil health principles that have been developed by the New Mexico Department of Agriculture to support uh, clarity about this soil health program. The topic of this uh, webinar today is of great interest to me because it's actually very complex and important. So it's a challenge and I like challenges. Many areas in New Mexico and even worldwide grapple with the questions of what we're addressing today. And there's still very little knowledge actually about issues of soil health improvement in new sedimentary soils, such as alluvial fans. So literally and figuratively, we're treading new bare ground with this topic. We're exploring and pioneering new ideas and solutions, and I hope you hang in there with me and chime into the conversation during the discussion, like um, Adrian suggested. So this is what we're going to talk about today. Restoring soil health in fields affected by sediment. And I emphasize again, I give the ecological planning perspective, and I hope you can maybe chime in with your uh, personal perspectives or experiences. So we're briefly touching again up on the focus area in uh, the lower Embudo Valley, and then the case study area that I've taken to uh, really study and, and discuss this problem of sediment. Um, we're going to look at uh, soil development and soil health in sediment. Um, what are the soil and health, soil development and soil health processes on alluvial fans? What are the challenges of soil health management of farming on such alluvial fans? And then we have a, a brief Q&A uh, where we can maybe uh, touch base with each other about your experiences. And then in the second part, we we'll move on to strategies to addressing soil health on uh, sedimentary soils. How we can assess the challenges and possibilities, for instance, with the bullseye method, how the five soil health principles apply, and how you manage sediment flows and improve sediment towards soil development. And then we'll end again with question and answers and discussion and a quick uh, look forward to the final webinar in two weeks. And then uh, a call for you to uh, submit evaluations again because we wanna know how we're doing. So I wanna, uh, let's see that I don't forget anything. Yeah, like I said, the, the topic is complex. So if there are any questions uh, about the complexity of the matter that I'm bringing, uh, send in your questions or comments so that we can address them during the question and answer. Uh, I have been looking around online, of course, what uh, there is out there in terms of scientific and experimental experiential documentation about how to effectively develop soils or a farm on alluvial soils. And uh, there wasn't that much. And so uh, we're really, uh, I think, addressing the cutting, cutting edge of, uh, of issues here uh, that uh, definitely is also based on experience uh, that I hope you can share. So our focus area is again the lower Embudo Valley as uh, depicted here on this map um, from the Rio Grande up to about Picaris Pueblo. And we're focusing particularly on uh, this area in Canyoncito, which is uh, here uh, east of Dixon, about three miles east, where there are uh, specific alluvial fans that are very pronounced and sometimes 10 feet above the river landscape. And that leads to uh, 
a good example area for where we want to work. Uh, this is the area just between Montecito and, and Canyoncito. So the focus of working with sediment, of course, originates from the problem of, of erosion. And so I want to show this map here that is uh, a result of the research we've done in the valley in the last uh, six years or so, and that led to the watershed plan that I helped develop. Uh, this is a map that shows uh, the areas of uh, erosion, uh, the red areas are highly erosive, very steep sandstone stone soils, uh, mostly bare rock areas, um, and are the major sources of dirt that provide the sediment uh, that we're dealing with in these problems of farming on sediment. Typically, these areas are so remote and steep and rocky that they're unsuitable for restoration treatment. The mostly related, uh, located on BLM and state land, uh, and uh, and so they're also hard to address because you have to work with these public agencies to collaborate. Now, fortunately, the agencies are uh, stepping forward, and uh, we might actually see some projects in the coming years that address these problems on these higher elevation areas. Then the yellow areas in between are the medium sloped areas of between 10 and 40% of slope. Uh, they're more sandy, loamy, sometimes gravelly. Uh, they're eroded rock and sediment. Uh, and they are the more prime treatment areas for soil health and, and plant cover because they're more accessible, not so steep, and, uh, but they're still uh, a little away from the private land. So even here, we will have to work with the public agencies to address the erosion. Then there are the green areas on this map, which are more flat. They're uh, below 10% in grade, fine textured soils like uh, silts and clays that together form loam. And um, they're mostly sedimentary. So that means they are formed by the dirt that washes down from those red, orangey, and sometimes yellow erosion areas. They are secondary in terms of priority for treatment because uh, they are not the source areas, and so and they're relatively smaller. Uh, but we'll focus on them today because uh, it is important, of course, to look at what you can do in the areas that are really important for the private landowners, for farmers in the area, or for people uh, with orchards or just backyards or businesses that um, experience the problem of the sediment that's flowing from those higher yellow. Uh, orange and reddish areas. So I've tried to express that also in this map that some of you may have uh, seen and remembered from the previous webinars, and that shows the cross section uh, in schematic uh, format for this valley. Um, if you know this landscape, of course, this entire uh, left hand side is much larger, so it's not to scale. I uh, focus on here, the more developed area that I call the lower sedimentation area, that it's stretched out in much greater detail. Um, but what you're seeing here is, again, from the left to the right, the forest area uh, higher up uh, that is in the Sierra or mountain zone of the landscape. And then going down, you get the woodlands and rangelands area in what is called the Montes. And the lower part of that is erosive and um, because it's a lot of loose material. Then you have the secano or the drier uh, sedimentation and erosion area. So there is partly eroding sediment there um, just above the village. It has some village components and, and dry farming or historically dry farming, but it's mostly right now uh, pinon and juniper and, and People use it for recreation, for walking. Um, and then you get the area along the road, the main road, and um, the first acequias, the highest acequias. In some literature, it's called the Acequia Alta and Altitos area. 
um, spread of villages. It's uh, irrigated and there are gardens. And then below that, you get to La Jolla area, which is high, quali high quality irrigated land. And then often there is a lower acequia. And below that, you get the acequia baja and La Vega area with fields, uh, orchards, farms, pasture, until you reach the river with the Cienega, Bosque, um, and the Rio, the river. That consists of wetlands, uh, pasture lands, some st streamside forests. So it is this lower area um, from the village down to the river that we're going to focus on today because that's mostly a sedimentation area. And it's mostly private land except for a little strip along the river here and there that's managed by the BLM. And those slopes um, are typically made up of uh, loamy soils, clay loam soils and clay soils, uh, so finer and finer sediment as you go down. And we'll address that later. So, Zooming in on that circle, if you remember uh, from a couple slides ago, we get to the area between Montecito and Cañoncito on State Road 580 towards Ojo Sarco. I've turned that map around. So uh, if you don't recognize it, uh, don't be surprised because now the north is at the bottom and the south is at the top of the map. And I have done that because our brains are more used to seeing the shade uh, upside down. So maybe if you look at this map, you can see some relief, some terrain differences a little better by doing it this way. And also in our brains, it makes a little bit more sense to think that water flows from top to bottom. So you have psychologically the idea that you can follow this drainage down from the highlands areas, the uplands areas down to the river area below. So, um, I'm going to see if I can use a little pointer. So here we have the river that runs from here to there, so from east to west. And then here we have this drainage area. It's only 62 and a half acres. And the main drainage channel runs down there like that. In the previous webinars, we looked at the Arroyo Los Arianos, which is the much larger drainage just here to the west. And uh, Dixon is about three miles that way to the west. Okay. So the northern part of this area is a collection zone of water. It has uh, more steeper slopes, Pinon Juniper woodland, and uh, lots of very fine drainages from where water flows down to that central drainage area. Then we get pretty much a flatter area uh, where the channel is most important and that's called a conveyance zone that conveys the water that, and the sediment that is collected in the upper part of this watershed down to what is called the alluvial fan from which the sediment and the water starts fanning out across the landscape in this way. And I will explain how this all happens and what this landscape look like, looks like. So the upper part looks like this. That's the Pinon Juniper woodlands with slopes to 30, 40%. And like we've seen in previous webinars, it's pretty bare and erosive. On the Western side, uh, the view to the east is like this, and you see basically the sequence of all the different landscape types that I've just mentioned, from the uh, Sierra to the Montes, and then here, what we're looking at is pretty much the Secano landscape. Lower down in this conveyance zone, uh, the landscape is a little flatter, although you still have erosion, but you also have sedimentation, and it's that sediment that sometimes in tracks and the old tracks like this uh, starts to erode again because of ruts in the road that carry that sediment then down to the main channel. And then where that channel hits the road, 
uh, it looks like this. So coming from the south, it flows over the road sometimes. Uh, in after big storms, it covers the road entirely. And the road almost forms a dam that hold, holds that, uh, that sediment and water back to some extent. Well, this watershed has a lower part too. An alluvial fan that is older, that is the brown area at the bottom of the map, uh, to the north, basically again, of this watershed. And that connects this upper watershed that is greenish with its alluvial fan to the old alluvial fan and the river. And so um, sometimes the alluvial fan must have provided so much sediment that actually here's the river, that sediment ended up on the other side of the river. And you can see that on old air photos. I went back to the earliest air photos that I could find to also see how this river started to meander uh, around actually the alluvial fan of sediment that this watershed dumped out here and the river had to go around it as you can see because it was obstructed by the sediment that flowed out here. Well, there are acequias too and these acequias were built on the alluvial fan and also therefore make like a U-shape around the sediment cone that has been deposited higher up here. So the entire watershed, including this lower brown area, is 87 and a half acres. Um, but this lower part, the 25 acres, are currently not so affected by the sediment anymore because a lot of that sediment gets into the higher acequia here and the lower acequia that runs there. I'm trying to get my pointer back so that I can actually. Okay, click to the next image. This is how it looks like. So the water, you've seen it come across the road uh, in the previous image. Here is where it goes across the road and starts to flow uh, down. So it flows with the sediment across the road and then falls down here, almost like a little waterfall. Some of it actually flows this way. It has two ways of getting across the road here. And then uh, a little lower down and then looking upstream, this is what it looks like. This channel, um, the, uh, the road is somewhere here and then it falls down and flows here. Uh, residents have built an access road that goes down all the way here next to this arroyo and the arroyo is somewhat diked or dammed to hold it in place. Otherwise it would probably go uh, valley wide. And then it starts to cross the upper acequia. Uh, and from this point on uh, to the right in this picture, um, it starts creating uh, the alluvial fan. It, it flows in from here, crosses the acequia behind me where I take the picture and then goes there to the right. And then looking north, this is the top of the alluvial fan. And from here, it starts flowing down through this channel and then to the left over the field. So to now explain the structure of an alluvial fan, it's important to identify a couple things. The highest point where the channel waters and sediments are spreading and where then the sediment is settling out to form this alluvial fan is called the apex, the highest point. That's also the top of the triangle shape that is basically the fan shape of the alluvial fan, right? Because out of this drainage, the sediment and the water fans out over the landscape. And why does it fan? Well, it fans out because every year that water carries so much sediment and also organic debris from small leaves and twigs and needles, sometimes entire logs, that these channels that are being formed by the water below this apex point are sometimes getting clogged by the sediment and organic debris. And then behind that clogging, the sediment builds up very rapidly to basically the bank level and then the water starts spreading behind a point like that and goes in a different direction. 
and that's what calls, causes that fan to, uh, to form. And it happens so often that these little channels uh, that are basically the outflow of that arroyo start forming multiple channels next to each other that each get clogged from time to time and start a new channel where they, when they jump the banks. And as a result of that, you can imagine that they form a fan, right? With multiple veins of old channels that, cross, that go across the landscape. If you uh, think of pictures of large alluvial fans like that of the delta of the Mississippi or the delta of the Amazon, you can remember maybe from those pictures that there are multiple channels coming out at some point that are fanning out into the ocean carrying all that sediment with it. And sometimes these channels, uh, one year they're more full because of, of water, other years they're not because they get clogged by the sediment. And in a very small scale in a landscape like this, that happens too. Now, as a result, as I said, of the acequias, uh, part, the inactive part, the lower brownish part is somewhat cut off from the immediate effect of the sediment and organic matter. And that leads then to a more active alluvial fan higher up. And that receives, of course, now the brunt of all the sediment and the water, and mostly the coarse sediment and the water. And the lower inactive alluvial fan has more of the finer sediment and only gets new water and sediment if it overtops the acequias in years that there is an exorbitant amount of water coming out of these uh, upper drainage areas. Uh, during flash flooding. So let's focus on that. So looking at this landscape, what we're seeing here is that uh, you have here the lower, I made a cross section from A to A plus or A accent. And so that represents this image that you see here in, in a schematic. So here on the eastern side, you see this orchard that's there, right? with the trees. Then you go up about 10 feet uh, to the eastern bank of a disalluvial fan. And I explain why, I'll explain explain why it is so steep. And then you get to the apex of the alluvial fan where there's a drainage channel maintained that you see in the picture. And then it fans out to the east, the southeast. And that is what this fan represents. And at the bottom, you have this acequia, which is there, right? And so you have some image so images that I represented schematically with, with the trees that are in this field. And then it goes down below the acequia, and that is this area. Now, it is so high here because the apex sent first a lot of coarse sediment out this way. And also, uh, the farmer has maintained a channel right here so that during high flash floods, most of the sediment still flows straight north. Only when it's allowed to do so, or when it overtops this channel, sediment starts fanning out this way. And you can see how that has gradually formed this U-shaped form of the landscape uh, that the acequia had to go around because the acequia has to nearly follow the contour line. So where it is all the same elevation or actually slightly lower going this way, that's where the acequia runs. So then you can also understand how this fan actually flows this way. Because this is a much older part of the fan. This again is lower. And then here, because this is maintained to be high, the current fanning takes place here on the green area. Okay, so the water flow then is of course in the landscape with the river from high to low, east to west. And that re relates to the old alluvial fan uh, soil with clay and loam here in this area that still has orchards and moderately good farming. And then you have the dynamic, uh, very dynamic, uh, high, somewhat elevated and dry landscape here that's much more sandy and gravelly with much more difficult farming, right? Water infiltrates, flows over here every year. Um, the water table is 80 inches deep, more or less. So it's quite, uh, quite deep. And then here on the side, it's more stable because you have less influence from whatever flows in here. The soils become finer and the farming 
uh, improves the farming potential. And then below it again, you have old alluvial soils with loam and clay and good orchards and good farming, theoretically. Because all kind of site-specific variations that are part of the history of this landscape or how it's being farmed uh, create the variations on the landscape. All right. Um, So here are some images of what it looks like. Again, bottom on a top left is an image uh, from the roadside looking down over the edge where the water flows down. There is also a culvert, but the culvert is way too small to carry all water and sometimes it gets clogged. You see the tip of the culvert uh, right here, if you look really well, but often a lot of water is just flowing over the road. And from there it flows down uh, through this drainage, like I mentioned, then it comes down here to the top of the Asekia. And um, that's here. You can see the Asekia, I think it's the Asekia Sankrochada, that flows from there down this direction. And there's a little bridge, you could say, uh, that carries the water from the arroyo with its sediment here over the Asekia. And that looks like this here in detail, where the Asekia is basically in a pipe. And then looking down, this is the image of when you look down uh, that channel that's being created from the apex of, uh, this is pretty much the apex location uh, down the uh, alluvial fan and fields that are there. So following that, uh, you can see more of that landscape. Um, here again, going down that channel um, and in the field to look east, uh, over that channel and to the side where this orchard is on the old alluvial fan uh, eight to ten feet below this uh, newer active alluvial fan. Going farther down the alluvial fan on the apex line channel, uh, this is what you see. And then standing there looking back up across the alluvial fan, this is what you see. Going farther down looking up, this is what you see up to a point where this channel pretty much ends and where um, the sediment flows out uh, over this meadow. So let's go back to this maybe now familiar image, um, but I'm going to talk about how farming really happens here. The interesting situation, especially here in the Embudo Valley, but it's typical for many alluvial fans is that relatively coarse grain size sediment um, is deposited on those alluvial fans. And as we've learned in the previous webinars, because of the coarse grain size, uh, it doesn't hold a lot of water. And also what comes down doesn't actually hold, uh, contains a lot of organic matter. Uh, and the structure of the grain size, like you can see back here in this picture, um, has big pores but water only adheres to the outer layer of uh, the grains of, of sand or clay or silt because of capillary action and a little bit of uh, uh, osmotic forces of water adhering to ions or molecules. And a lot of these uh, voids here, these pores, um, have no capacity to hold the water, so it just drains out. So sedimentary soils are, again, notorious for not holding water very long unless they have organic matter mixed in and a better mixture of finer sediments that are in between these coarser sand uh, grains. So another interesting thing is as a result of the rapid um, influx of sediment from time to time, plants cannot really establish uh, deep rooting uh, unless you protect them from those pulses. So in much of the landscape of the lower Embudo Valley along the river, the uh, B horizon that we've learned about, the rooting zone in the parent material uh, that has uh, a decent amount of organic matter is missing. So the rooting depth may be compromised in a lot of these soils. So the, the rooting depth is typically only um, 10 to 12 inches of 
but pretty heavy organic soil, also because it's farmed. And then you're pretty much sinking directly into a sea horizon. In some places that have a, a good history of not a lot of plowing and that have been left alone, there might be a bee horizon forming of several inches, but it's not very strong. So you have some rootlets that go into the C1 horizon here. They're not even given in this image, but uh, pretty much you're soon into the sedimentary C2 horizon where there is actually no rooting happening at all. So most of the organic matter are only in the top 12 inches of the soil. So and then you get with each new pulse of sediment that a new layer of sediment is being deposited on top of that organic matter. And part of that organic matter is even being disturbed and washed away. It smothers some of the plants. And uh, so that's why I showed that there's still maybe some tips <laughs> coming out. But um, this is what you get. You get a layer cake of, of sediment. And only with plowing can you actually mix that up well enough that you can grow again in those kind of soils. So to summarize that, here on the active alluvial fan, that is that green area again, right? Um, you have a very dynamic situation of almost annual flooding and sedimentation, a crisscross layered sediment um, layering, a relatively coarse sediment of sands, some fields, sometimes even gravels, higher up, uh, especially here near the apex and along the main channel. Um, and that's also why this area is higher, because the compaction of that is lesser and uh, it, they kind of uh, are deposited uh, the soonest because the, the finer sediment is carried longer by the water because it weighs less, of course, and then settled out much farther down. So there is a patchy or linear distribution of organic matter. Think about it that in the, that water and sediment flows out almost in the shape of a hand. And if you look at your hand, it also has this fan size, right? And along the outline of your fingers, uh, that is where the flow of the water is least. And that's where um, these lines of twigs and leaves and needles are being deposited, where actually the energy of water is pretty low. And so you have a pretty uh, uneven distribution of organic matter that is then further covered again with uh, sediment later on. So that leads to the problem that it's really not prime farmland in many cases. Looking at the soil survey for this area, you have um, what is called Joe City and Gilco soil uh, complexes here uh, on slopes of one to three uh, percent with uh, sometimes uh, the influence of the gravelly fine sandy loam soils that come from this higher area. And this acequia is pretty much laid on the soil difference between the sandy gravelly upland area here and the Josephy Gilco complex that starts here, that is on the alluvial fan. So whatever sediment erodes here and is accumulated and is being sent over here starts to cover this part, especially during flash flooding. And that's the influence of the fine gravelly sand that you may see from time to time being carried out from the soil type that is, that is different than from the soil type that is being formed here. So the depth to restrictive features like that rock or uh, caliche layers or whatever you may have, or large layers that are uh, restrictive to groundwater um, are uh, deeper than 80 inches, which is pretty good at least to a, a farmable soil of 80 inches, except, and I'll get to that, that you may have clay lenses and caliche layers that are uh, localized, almost like lenses in here, again, deposited uh, by, by the arroyo. Uh, but it also leads that to the point that groundwater is deeper than 80 inches in many places. So the Gilco soils are the coarser soils here at the top. Uh, they have uh, an A horizon uh, up to 12 inches of loamy sand. Then you get a C1 and a C2 of 12 to 50 inches and 50 to 60 inches of stratified loamy sand uh, with sandy loam or uh, 
deeper down loamy material. Uh, the infiltration is relatively okay here. It has a hydrologic soil group B, which means moderate infiltration when thoroughly wetted and moderately well to well drained soils with moderately fine to moderately coarse texture. But going down here at, towards the um, sequia and, des and definitely lower down here in the brown area, you have the uh, Gilco soils that have um, a slightly shallower sandy loam A horizon, um, also shallower C1 and C2 horizons with uh, finer material and a C3 or R horizon that starts um, also a little shallower at 42 to 60 inches with mostly sandy loam. And there the infiltration is lower. Um, so they have soil layers that impede downward movement and uh, more moderately fine to fine structure. However, farming on those areas is generally a little better. And we'll get to that in the next slide. So because looking at these inactive alluvial fans in the, in the brown area, um, they are more stable. Uh, there are few arroyo flow dynamics, mostly because it's farther away and the acequia may have caught actually some or a lot of that sediment. There might be some annual flooding actually in the lower part uh, as a result of the river um, and the river floodplain that is there. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that might not be so beneficial because also the river may be carrying a lot of uh, coarse material. There's still a lot of crisscross layered sediment uh, here, but it's typically better mixed. Uh, the layers are thinner and because of farming activity and time, uh, they are better mixed. The finer sediments um, on the slopes and along the channels here of small rivulets that go down, uh, there's very fine sediment in the lower areas in depressions. Organic matter distribution is largely determined by local vegetation. Whatever grows here, of course, creates its own uh, organic matter that comes down on the land and is gradually worked into the soil. And over, in general, this is prime farmland. And it's also because there is seepage and underground flow from this a uh, higher infiltration area of the alluvial fan going down in here. And of course, it's irrigated by the acequias and sub-irrigated uh, in the alluvial gravel bottoms of the entire river. So it has typically um, more water available for plants. It has the same type of soils um, that I mentioned for the upper area. The soil survey doesn't make much difference in that, except that I interpret that the Josidi soils um, are uh, lower down here. And, uh, and we just talked uh, already about what they are. So that leads us then to understanding um, how farming takes place here. Well, there are farming challenges really on these alluvial fans. Uh, the layered sediment leads to uh, underground crust that might be clay or caliche. I mentioned that there is poor soil mixing, typically a pretty high pH, that uh, might be uh, as high as eight, uh, low organic soil content, uneven water distribution, and infiltration that is too slow or too fast, depending on the site-specific soil condition. That leads then uh, to patchy productivity. And that is particularly here on the higher part. Those problems get less and less as you go down the alluvial fan. Um, there are annual, annual sediment pulses that cover the plants and clog the acequias and drainage channels. And as I mentioned, it, it's every year in different locations. Uh, theoretically, if you have created like drainage channels on an alluvial fan, that's where they will be. But that means that the rest of the alluvial fan will get less water or that you have to create irrigation systems to uh, bring that water from those drainage channels on your fields. And many people have actually done that. Um, another problem of farming challenges, of course, is the concentrated flow coming out of these arroyos. Um, 
that leads to erosion at some places, especially in the steeper locations, and also down at the tips of the alluvial fans. And I haven't seen that as much in the Dixon area, but some alluvial fans have a steeper tip out, out there, and um, that leads to, uh, to small rills and gullies sometimes near the river. Um, then there might be channel blockages uh, that lead again then to flooding, new channels and new sediment areas. So this requires from farmers to be kind of creative to anticipate where the water and the sediment comes from, to be uh, persistent, to have grit as a farmer, and to be as dynamic as nature in following that water and following that sediment. And that can lead sometimes to just uh, racing around, maintaining your fields, especially in years that there is plenty full of rainfall during the summer and a lot of sediment and water coming down. So therefore, you need to look upstream from, for solutions. Upstream in time, upstream in space, and upstream in ecological systems. You need to start thinking what happens literally upstream so that you can slow and spread and split the water flows, but you need to also look at the causes of the problems on your fields, not only at the symptom of what this sediment and water, uh, that erratic flow of water and sediment does, you need to look at the causes and address those causes. Um, and that sometimes means that you need to collaborate because the uh, upstream areas may not be part of your property. And therefore, working as a con community or uh, working with the public land agencies like in, in the Dixon area is important in these cases. So I uh, encourage everybody to start uh, talking with the state land office and the BLM and the highway department, if that um, doesn't happen already, to uh, deal with these problems effectively. And maybe that this webinar will offer a couple of hints what you might want to talk about. So uh, to summarize it, the top of this um, alluvial fan, where a lot of that coarse sediment comes in, is uh, what's sometimes called the proximal area, because it's most proximal to the apex, or it is the apex proximal to the inflow of water, has a lot of sand and gravel, and may be unsuitable for farming. Or uh, it is suitable, but requires a lot more labor and technology and work to make it suitable. Then um, you have the, and I need to click again, the lower area that is much better suitable um, as you go down the slope because then the uh, immediate effects of the sand, the flash flooding, et cetera, that comes out of the arroyo is more distributed and uh, there is, uh, you, you can actually work better in that so-called distal area, the area that is at a greater distance of the apex. Now at this point, we're about halfway. So I want to see if there are any questions at this point about the theory of alluvial fans and uh, what the challenges might be for farming on them. And uh, the reality may in some cases be uh, more nuanced, of course. Uh, it might be uh, that you have experienced uh, differences, maybe beneficial, maybe not so. So it would be interesting to hear those. So I see a question that's asking how old is the acequia that uh, we're working with here? Okay, I want to bounce that question back. Um, is there somebody in the audience who knows? And there are two acequias. There is the upper acequia that I mentioned. And I think that's the Asequia Sancochada. And the lower Asequia, it may, it may be a branch of the Sancochada, maybe it's not. And um, if somebody knows, uh, please let me know. And maybe I have it wrong. Maybe upper Asequia is something else and the lower one is the Sancochada. I hope that somebody can help me out here. And can I speak to that? This is please. Robert. Yeah, the upper Asequia is Sancochada. The lower Asequia is Medio. <clears throat> and the... Dates are not known. Uh, the first Asequias in Dixon were in 1725. These were probably later. They certainly were in probably in the early 1800s. Although the Medio may be older than that, it's, it's really not well known. Thank you. 
Thank you. Great. Well, that tells you something about the alluvial fan age. Very interesting, because it means that the alluvial fan was already partly there, because you uh, may remember that bulging curve that the lower acequia, the, the medio, um, had on the landscape, right? And it had to go around uh, that uh, alluvial fan. So we're looking at an alluvial fan that's hundreds of years old. Uh, and that, uh, especially the top part, is still active. The lower part is much more inactive and definitely inactivated, probably as a result of, that, of the uh, acequia medio. Uh, okay, I'm off mute. So the follow-up to that was, uh, yeah, this person was wondering if that was what people were dealing with for centuries. I think that's what we uh, should assume, that people have been dealing with this for centuries. What we should also realize is that as erosion um, progressed in this landscape that you can see here, uh, because this is taken from the edge of uh, the watershed on the west side of the um, case study drainage uh, that you see on the right-hand side of the picture. The left-hand side is the Arroyo de los Arianos. Uh, you, we now are dealing with the erosion of the more coarse material. All the fine material has already eroded or blown away. And so we're increasingly dealing with coarser sands and gravels coming down because they are uh, largely left and now being unearthed in those watersheds. And so um, I, I think that we're proportionally just seeing more of that material uh, flowing, flowing down the, uh, the drainage in and onto the alluvial fan. So it, it probably has changed gradually in terms of the coarseness of material coming down. And that will probably lead to the top of the, uh, of the alluvial fan uh, getting steeper because the coarser the material, the steeper it can be, but also that material gets drier because the coarser the material, the less water it can actually contain. Two questions about the HSG. Does it take into account land management and if, is the data found on the web, the so, web soil survey in RCS, USGS? So that's two questions. Um, my understanding is that it is, um, regardless of uh, land management, it is um, a classification based on soil uh, structure and texture. And uh, it has to do with particle size and how the soil um, layering is built up. Um, and then uh, it is all found on the web soil survey uh, that you can hone into for this area, exactly. And uh, you can also just Google uh, uh, hydrologic soil groups and get into the background information of the definitions um, online under what the NRCS or universities that have done research on, on these things describe on hydrological soil groups. And uh, I basically summarized the, a standard definition. The, the standard definition is much larger. It, it is about a quarter of a page to so half a page for each of them. Uh, but I boiled that down to the key issues that I put on the screen. So another question, if you're looking at where the alluvial fan is deposited, the active is today, is it, should we assume that that will, where will that alluvial fan move to next? I think it will largely stay in place because of the current vegetation. I um, expect that, um, yeah, if people keep maintaining the acequia, um, maintain the coarse vegetation of trees and shrubs on the landscape, that actually, um, it will stay where it is. Um, certain, uh, the, the upper acequia, the San Cochada, may see more and more water flow uh, into the acequia, so it will require, uh, or sediment flow in the acequia, so 
over time it will require more maintenance. And that depends uh, also on how the upper watershed is being maintained. Currently, the off-road vehicle use there is limited. There is some. Uh, but if that area is going to be targeted for off-road vehicle use, like the area we saw two weeks ago, uh, which is the area behind the um, the co-op and and and, um, and the library, then this area will see much greater erosion, and uh, that will definitely have impacts on this alluvial fan. So maintaining uh, the upper watershed, keeping that intact as it is right now, more or less is very important and we'll get to that in uh there's almost a nice segue to unless there's one more burning question i'd like to move on it's a comment it's actually from robert he spoke earlier he said many of us are farming in the older parts of the alluvial fan but now the arroyo is channeled and there's no longer new deposit but the soil is poor at holding water interested in soil improvement techniques in such areas. Yes, and that's what the next um, um, webinar is going to be all about, because I was aware of that. So we're going to look at, at in two weeks, exactly at those kind of situations with uh, Stan Crawford's farm as a, as a case study. But we'll talk a little bit more in this webinar also about the differences between the active and the inactive alluvial fan. So, uh, I hope that by the end, maybe part of your question is answered. So that again, is a nice segue to maybe move on right now. Uh, thank you all for the questions and comments. So I want to do uh, a brief uh, land assessment here uh, with this, these images that I'm giving here on the right as a case study. Uh, again, this is the bullseye method that I'm using. And this method is, uh, really helpful because it helps you track changes over years and monitoring is basically a form of tracking progress and seeking early warning signals for desired and undesired change. Well, it's very applicable to areas like these alluvial fans. Uh, because it's a hands-on tool, uh, you have direct feedback from this method. It takes about 10 or 15 minutes and it is somewhere between doing no monitoring or only taking pictures and detailed technical qualitative monitoring. It's practical, science-based, qualitative, rapid appraisal approach, can be used in combination with qualitative, quantitative monitoring if you want. And uh, it's easily documented uh, so that you can compare the outcome charts uh, for each season or year that you take these data and you combine them with some pictures and you have a very good track record for how your field is doing. Uh, it's interactive, so you can do it in a group, and that leads then to collaborative learning. Uh, again, I think it's very useful. Uh, so I would encourage everybody to look at these pictures. Uh, of course, they're limited. We're not in the field, uh, but this is as best as I could do for our purposes here. And we're going through some of the questions and see, uh, note down for yourself or send them in the chat what your answers would be. And then we're going to see at the end what my uh, answers were. So here we're looking at the assessment of their ground. Uh, and we're wondering whether we're achieving the goal and whether the amount and size of their areas is nearly or totally matching that of what's expected or desired for the future in this site. Or is it uh, that it's larger or less than expected and desired for the site? or far less or far larger than expected desired. And I'm still talking about bare ground. So what we're seeing here is that there are definitely patches of connected bare ground. Instead of areas like we've seen two weeks ago where that is caused by erosion, this is caused by sedimentation, by flows of dirt flowing between the grass here, especially visible in the lower picture, almost smothering the grass. And the landowner also mentions this. Uh, we visited a couple times and he said that flash flows uh, lead to sediment blanketing, uh, plants getting covered, damage to crops, and then it dries out again. Everything cracks, plants die off, right? So he wishes that that be addressed. So where do you think we are in the gold, silver, or bronze, or higher, low gold, higher, low silver? So put it down for yourself. 
And in terms of erosion, what are we seeing here? Little or no evidence of wind or water erosion, including desert pavement, rills, and gullies. And those terms were addressed in the last webinar, and I just don't have time, unfortunately, to do that here. Um, or do we see some signs? Or do we see a lot of signs and advanced formation of, of erosion features? Well, I don't see a lot, but you have to walk around and you can maybe see some erosion in the sediment that was deposited. Uh, but I uh, welcome your feedback. Plant pedestalling, which is an erosion feature by itself, uh, meaning plants being on a little stool of one or two inches with their roots exposed. Do we see none of that, some, or a lot? So then the next image is about litter, litter distribution and litter amounts. Do we see a lot of litter here? And do, does it match what we might expect for a site like this? And either it's the expectation based on experience or based on what you can find in the scientific literature that you should have here. And so, uh, therefore, it is a qualitative rather than a quantitative uh, nomenclature here. So, is it less than you expect or desire, or far less? For the litter distribution, what do you think? Is it uniformly distributed? or not, right? We found actually that it was not so uniformly distributed, very much like what I've discussed earlier about litter distribution on alluvial fans. Litter incorporation, was it mixed well in the soil or not, so that it leads to rapid mineral cycling? Or was it some that was mixed and some was just on top of it, or even just standing dead? Dung breakdown, well, that was a hard one and you cannot really see that here. And actually we didn't see a lot of animal activity, so we can actually skip that. So then we go to desirable plants, age classes and species diversity and functionality. So if the desirable plants are greater than 66% and you have uh, very few undesirable, including weeds, then you're in the gold. If you're between 33 and 66, you're in the silver. Less than 33 desirable plants, 33% desirable plants, you're in the bronze. And then you can figure out for yourself if it's kind of 90% uh, desirable plants, you're really high gold, et, et cetera. Age class distribution, the same kind of question. A uh, variety of age classes seen in the area is high, then you're in the gold. If there is more mature age classes present, and seedlings and young are missing or the other way around, if you have no mature and only young plants, then you're in the silver. In the bronze is that it's really uh, old or deteriorating plants or only seedlings and there's just really very little variability. Plant species diversity is how many different species do you have and how functional are they? Do they uh, help with erosion control or sediment dispersal? Do they provide habitat? Do they provide shade? Uh, all those kind of things. And uh, are they of different set plant, plant types uh, so that they provide different functions for other living organisms? So if there's a lot of different uh, differences, then you're in the gold. If it's moderate, then you're in the silver. And if it's all the same, if you have almost like a monoculture of one or another species or what they do, then they're more in the bronze. So note it down for yourself. Now, the landowner um, felt that there was a lot of brush, a lot of weeds, and patchy vegetation cover. Now, um, living organisms is another one to look at, plant canopy. Um, we didn't see a lot of living organisms. Plant canopy was pretty good. Uh, so that is how much green there is, how much photosynthesis and uh, plant vigor. Is it alive? Uh, does it reproduce? And then plant distribution. Is it evenly spread, evenly distributed across the landscape? If any of those categories is somewhat good, um, then it's silver. If it's really very uh, poor, in say distribution 
fragmented, then it's uh, more in a bronze. So let's see what I found. And th what did people find, actually? Th do we have feedback, Adrian? I don't see any yet. OK, so everybody can compare for themselves. So we saw some bare ground. Uh, it, so it was not ideal, not in the gold, but it was uh, pretty good. So I scored it in a high silver. With erosion, we didn't see any, although we saw pretty much signs of sedimentation, meaning uh, erosion higher up. And also there were some signs of erosion, but you couldn't see that in that picture of a sediment that was eroding again in little rills. And plant pedestalling, well, there was none of that because all the plants were not neatly covered. So that's high gold. Litter, well, there was some litter, uh, but not all over the place. And there might have been more litter if it weren't all washed away, maybe. The litter distribution also therefore was patchy. So it was probably reasonably okay, but definitely not in the gold. So I scored it mid-silver. Litter incorporation, also the same. Uh, some was incorporated, some was not. Dung breakdown and incorporation, we couldn't really answer. I didn't see much. Desirable plants, I think a lot of the plants were desirable, although some were not. There were some weeds coming up. Age class distribution, there were some old, some young, but there was a middle group missing. And therefore, I scored it in a high silver, but not quite gold yet. Plant species diversity and functionality, the same. It was um, somewhat patchy, that vegetation. and. Uh, not multiple stories of vegetation. It was uh, not quite functional. Uh, there were patches of almost either the same grass or the same shrub, uh, but not a combination of plants that you would want in an area like this. We didn't see any living organisms, although there were maybe some gophers and ants, so I scored that relatively low. The plant canopy was actually pretty good. It covered a lot. Plant health was relatively good and plant distribution too. So that all came out in the gold. So um, I'm moving on, but you might want to, typically in a situation like this, make observations about water cycle, mineral cycle, uh, whether living communities are interactive with each other, whether there is uh, photosynthesis activity in the energy flow. Uh, in this case, not optimal, reasonably good, but hampered by the sediment, of course. And then the questions are, what are your solutions? Well, in this case, uh, occasional grazing might be act actually happening to distribute and incorporate litter and to get more animal activity going and some more organic matter uh, brought into the soil. The fact that litter is purely distributed and not so incorporated is actually a sign that living organism presence is maybe too low. So, as a reminder, the five healthy soil principles, keeping the soil covered, uh, we've seen that in the past, and also you can in, uh, intuit how important that is here. Min minimizing soil disturbance, uh, that is a, a questionable situation here because we definitely want to have organic matter and even the, the different layers of particles more mixed into the soil, so we will have to have some disturbance. And so minimal is always a relative uh, situation, a, a relative uh, word. External inputs, well, we may have to have some, um, but if you can work with the local inputs, of course, it's more cost effective. Maximizing biodiversity, we definitely want that. That's always important. Maximizing a living root, yes, we want good roots in an area like this to, to bring uh, organic matter down and to pump water up and integrate animals uh, that was already actually suggested. So that leads then to how you use those five principles. So important is to start at the top of the system by removing the degrading causes, the stressors in that landscape, removing the soil disturbance in that upper watershed. And again, negotiate with the upstream landowners about land use and terrain conditions that cause the erosion and sediment flows. Removing degrading causes caused by just the water and the sediment flow itself, the flash flooding. So you need to build structures that slow, retain the water, split the flows, 
as high up as possible. Then we, once the water hits the field at the point of the apex and where the uh, Acequia Sancochara uh, starts to interact with the arroyo and from where the arroyo starts splitting it over the alluvial fan, you need to start splitting that water as much as you can, slowing it, spreading it, sinking it, uh, so that that water is well distributed with its sediment across the alluvial fan. And then you need to start looking at each field and whether you can actually invest in that field with an eye on the ongoing risks. So by building structures or irrigation systems all across the field, you may actually um, have fields where you invest maybe a little too much and uh, in other fields, maybe not enough. So also how you deal with that with a view to biodiversity is is important. Um, then supporting and using existing plants, additional seeding and planting is important, and therefore creating vegetative buffers to stabilize the slopes, create and maintain buffer zones, um, buffer plantings, and to catch sediment and water in those strips. So and plant to optimize plant cover and biodiversity and promote living, pr promote living root networks. Then at the lower level, of, at the more detailed level of soil structure and cover, it's important to add organic matter and microbes by spreading native um, soil cover materials. Uh, more maybe the litter that you find on the land needs to be better distributed, maybe adding more compost and mulch. Um, microbial inoculants maybe with compost teas, but also loosen compacted crusted soil. And we're, we're going to see how we do that. And finally, bringing in animals, but if they help with all these uh, previous steps, especially with uh, manuring and, and um, breaking crusts and bringing organic matter deeper in. And then it, uh, it is very important to commit to maintenance, observation and improvements, uh, for instance, zoom monitoring and adaptive management. So, Looking back at this uh, map, uh, the summary is that you definitely have to work at the watershed level here at area A, at the slopes and the channels um, to hold the water back. Then to figure out whether the alluvial fan apex can be brought higher up so that you can, from a higher point, start spreading that water and splitting it, because then you have a bigger area in this specific location that will be hard, uh, difficult but I put it in, in this model so that you at least keep that in mind for other alluvial fans. Then at the field level, it's a focus on water spreading. Um, at the soil level, uh, focusing on soil cover, organic matter, soil structure, and infiltration improvements. And at the process level, at maintenance, monitoring, and adaptive management. So um, let's see. You may have wondered why it took so much time to reach this point to explain about management practices. Well, the reasons are that we need to distinguish between maintaining soil health and restoring or building healthy soil. And the latter is much more complicated and site specific. And we're quite in a pioneering stage here regarding soil building on alluvial fans. Uh, and site specific conditions uh, include terrain conditions and processes, a landowner objectives and per perspectives that all have to be taken in consideration too and make it even more complex. Uh, maintaining soil health is, is complex and there is no silver bullet, no one size fit all, fits all. And restoring and building soil is even more complex uh, on each site given its history and the moving targets of land use and climate disruption. And each terrain uh, is different and therefore observing and identifying terrain conditions and ecological processes is about half the work. And there is not one solution. We need to keep in mind that it's best to figure out a combination of solutions. So again, looking at the bigger landscape, uh, some may have seen this picture from a previous webinar. Looking at the upstream area, it's really important to figure out what you can do to give that upstream area more rest. Uh, 
because it's these upstream areas that uh, lead to a lot of downstream effects. And especially with so many of these drainages, 105 drainages of the 118 drainages in the Lure and Budo watershed are smaller than a, uh, a square kilometer or 247 acres. Um, it is really important to start figuring out how we can maintain uh, calm and rest, you could say, in those small drainages. Because once that is upset, uh, the, the current conditions, the, um, the flows in those drainages become much more flashy. And flash floods lead to erosion and immediate uh, sedimentation impacts downstream with the flash floods of water and the sediment. So healing the small drainages will show immediate effect and uh, will, uh, and it's really important therefore um, to, to figure out how we can keep those drainages intact. So here are some of the techniques that we could use like sediment dams with spillways uh, here in this landscape. Um, the arroyo flow was this way, it was interrupted with a dam, and so the water was spread out more, in intercepting another arroyo there with a spillway there, so it could be spread out over a lower wetland area here, and that the uh, sediment was retained behind a dam like that. Uh, in a much smaller situation, just here in Arroyo de los Arianos, a similar situation was established by putting a dam, which is now totally buried, so that water wouldn't go into this arroyo, but go around it, and then you spread the water out and you settle down the sediment. Uh, another approach here in Arroyo Los Pinos Reales, just uh, a quarter mile to the east of our study area for this webinar, where we installed a lot of thicket veins that actually slowed down the water and spread it out over three parallel drainages um, so that you could, we caught actually thousands of tons of sediment upstream from this. And you can see here in the first year after installation, uh, we already caught a lot. A couple years later, you see how wide this arroyo has become and uh, probably a foot of sediment was degraded behind it. Or here in the Arroyo Los uh, Arianos, where just a picket and wicker vein uh, moved this water over, made it meander, and a lot of sediment was caught here. Natural wetland vegetation uh, was built on top of it, and that caught even more sediment. Or here with rock structures, where you still need to have a spillway so you control where the water is going. But we caught hundreds of tons of sediment right here along the uh, Asequia Junta de Cienega, which is just running downstream here. Or here, where we built plug and spreads uh, here in a, on a ranch much farther away, but we intercepted the flow um, and water was shunted off on the side on these terraces with this mesquite field. Or here in the Abudo Valley in the Arroyo Los Pinos Reales, where uh, again an arroyo was intercepted with a plug and then the water was shunted off to the side and spread out over a slope. Same here in the Cañadita del Agua uh, in Cañancito, just a couple of hundred yards over to the east of uh, our study area where they blocked the flow and I'll show you how we did that. So we filled up this arroyo and spread the water and sediment over the floodplain. So here are the structures that were used post wicker rock weirs during construction and below it after construction. And you can see how they caught uh, sediment and spread out the flows. And double post wicker rock weirs at the top center and then the bottom after. And that led to partly that um, plug and spread system that spread the water over the floodplain. And that helps then to establish entire old wetlands that were old here and now totally renewed by spreading that water across. And that creates a huge plug that holds back an entire upper watershed. Then on the slope level, you spread the flows with rock line terracing or straw bale terracing. 
and the water spreads out behind it, overtops it, or you create a little spillway like here where you safely let that water flow under uh, over rocks that gets then to basically a lower part of the slope and then you run it all the way back on this side. So that water and the sediment backs up behind these structures and then you capture a lot of sediment, the water infiltrates and um, no erosion of course takes place on those slopes and you keep the sediment pretty much uh, on the slopes. Slash terracing can happen like this. You can do it with a uh, slash like this on a pinyon juniper slope, but also with the slash from fruit trees on um, an alluvial fan of a field. Log terracing works the same way, where you capture the flow in a drainage, maybe with some rock structures, shunt it off on the slopes, and then because these logs are slightly off contour, they slope down away from the center, the water and the sediment will follow that eventually just spreads down over the slopes. Or you use earthen lead out drains when you have an arroyo or a roadside ditch where you then lead that water out and let it settle on the slope. Or with an earthen berm like in this uh, image. Or with berms and swales like in these images. Um, where the water is caught, uh, you protect this berm here with some stones and then it flows down and continues here. You let it overflow on some rock mattress and then a media luna splits and spreads it further. And here are these media lunas in a, in a channel preventing that that water channels and creates erosion in the center and spreads out all the time and keeps that uh, channel valley bottom really flat uh, without ever uh, incising and cutting. And behind it, you of course catch a lot of sediment. Or here where a rock and log and brush lines put on contour, intercepts the flow and spreads it out and sends it to an area and a slope where you maybe have put some slash down. Or you put a picket uh, dam down with some brush that is put in between to further spread the flow over the slopes and prevent it ever from concentrating. So that again, the water is slowed down, the sediment already falls down where you put the brush and the structures. And then you can create sediment traps um, with rock or straw bale systems where you first catch a lot of sediment. And especially when it's along the road, every two or three years, you can dig this out or even replace the straw bales when necessary. And so with that, you catch a lot of sediment and actually can control where that sediment is going. Important is also to maintain terraces and vegetation buffers. Uh, if you get really fancy, you can turn that into full agroforestry systems, combine it, uh, so that you basically have combined terracing, agroforestry, and vegetation buffer systems. Um, therefore, keeping the existing vegetation strips on the landscape is important and uh, not in the Hara, Lahara, remove everything so that it's permanently open. Because I think especially on alluvial fans, uh, that would lead to trouble and overtopping and breaches of these berms uh, sometimes. Um, also the rooting of these plants will pump water and minerals up so you get better soil mixing on these alluvial fans. So especially these types of alluvial fans need a lot of native vegetation and planted vegetation to maintain the biodiversity and the soil quality and soil health. Whenever you need to, additional planting and seeding is of course very important too. Now, come on, there we go. And then you can use cover crops, natural mulches and compost, key line plowing to break surface crusts and deeper crusts, or do imprinting. Uh, there was a question last time, so I looked it up further. Uh, besides the imprinting answer that I gave, which is much for, for smaller scale areas, the imprinting is often done with big imprinting machines where you actually create divots across the landscape to break the crust and create areas where plants can actually grow out. Uh, I've witnessed that only once. I'm not sure. Um, you need to really look up online in what situations that is beneficial. 
but for some farms with a crusting and poor infiltration, this is a very good way of uh, improving uh, surface infiltration and creating microhabitats for uh, plants to grow. Then finally, introducing animals um, to again do a poop and stump, uh, bringing all the organic matter deeper into the soil um, and helping with uh, yeah, bringing life back to the land is, is important. And I think that might definitely be a special thing to remember for these alluvial fans uh, where you need to have more integration of organic matter into the soil and manuring that brings uh, microorganisms down into the soil more rapidly. And where you cannot do that, bringing in earthworms as an inoculant that spreads then through those areas might be very helpful as well. So what does not work? Well, it is important to think that just only doing one thing is not really helping. Uh, only doing maintenance or only working in the fields or only spreading water uh, is not actually helping structurally uh, with the core problems of these landscapes. Um, only working in the fields doesn't stop the inflow of large amounts of water and mud. Uh, only spreading water uh, will help it sink and drain away, but often there's not enough organic matter in the topsoil to actually hold it. Only planting and sowing may be an investment that doesn't address the source causes, uh, the source and the causes of the problems, which are the concentrated flows that come from area A. Um, mulching and composting is very important, uh, but it needs to be worked out into the soil. So therefore, again, uh, extra work and animal activity is important. Only adding compost tea, again, is also costly because you often lack the organic matter to for the compost tea to hold on to. So a combination of things is really important. And it takes time, experimentation, observation, trial and error. And there is really, as I said earlier, not one best solution. And often a combination of practices works best. So working upstream in area A um, is really important to retain that water and dirt and make it slow down and diminish the flows. And then spread it as early as you can. And if possible, get that apex area moved upstream. And then in areas C and D, combine all the various techniques that I talked about and get that organic matter worked into the soil and then observe, uh, monitor, and shift your focus areas uh, almost through rotational improvements so, uh, because the water will do that too. It will shift itself on the alluvial fan and you have to follow that. And that means therefore that soil healing is like a, a two-step, huh? a quick, quick, slow, slow, right? Because you have the monitoring and the maintenance and you need to observe, take notes, do photography and adapt your plans. And that is the slow, slow part. And once it comes to the maintenance, you have to catch that water and catch that sediment. Anticipating and following these uh, rapid high flow impacts and uh, following then the slow times when the years are dry and you don't have many flash floods. So then repairing and shifting the water and sediment spreading structures, like I mentioned, uh, shifting your cropping and resting cycles and animal activities. And keep in mind, it's all trial and error uh, and finding a balance between your lessons learned and using intuition as much as you can. So then in two weeks, we'll be talking about uh, areas where uh, we don't have as much sediment and what you need to do to maintain your soil. And as I mentioned, we're going to Stan Crawford's uh, El Bosque Farm as a case study for that um, for that session. So now with that, I'm again over time. Boy, I'm too enthusiastic in talking. But if there are questions, I'm re staying here to entertain them. And I hope if you have time, stay as well. Thank you, Jan Willem. That was a lot of really excellent information. I learned a lot myself. and. Um, just imagining all that within the area was um, really lovely. 
I, I did want to mention while you all are typing in or if you want to hold off, you can also ask verbally that we will be sending you a survey and a follow up email as well as the materials which include the slideshow and the curriculum in case you did not get those um, when we sent them out yesterday. So with that, I will definitely open up the floor to verbal questions because I don't see any types. So if you just unmute yourself and uh, have a go at it. Okay, <laughs> a question popped up, and since nobody's unmuting themselves. Regarding restoration techniques, this is from Ashley Giles. And because I work in water here in Colorado, I'm guessing Asakia has served two purposes historically, conveying water and managing sediment. Or are there layers in Asakia's, of Asakia's built on top of each other? Each other? Does NMSHPO, have interest in this. I'm not sure what SHPO is, but maybe you do, Jan Willem. Yeah. Um, SHPO stands for the State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, I believe that's what Ashley means. And if not, then uh, I hope she speaks up. Um, so Asekias were typically only for conveying water, not so much for managing sediment. That has been uh, um, almost a uh, undesired additional service that they have been providing. Of course, the sequias had to be cleaned. Uh, it was called the limpia. And then they had to be, uh, all the vegetation that was obstructing flows had to be removed, the lahara. But um, it is with these landscapes that have increasingly endured the impacts of grazing, um, deforestation, uh, mining, etc. But over the last couple of hundred years, uh, and especially the last 125, 130 years, these landscapes have been eroding much more seriously than, say, before the 1850s or even before the 1880s. And so um, the, the great erosion uh, started around the 1880s. And that's an entire separate uh, webinar that I can uh, explain why that is and how we know that. Um, also, after that time, we've seen many more forest fires, so especially also in this landscape. So erosion and uh, flash floods have been increasing after the 1880s. And so, and that was 100 years, sometimes 200 years after the Ezekias were initially built. And so it is in the last 100, and year, 100 years, more or less, that we've seen the problems of sedimentation. and. Um, there is definitely a layering, a, a, a storied landscape on these alluvial fans, because the landscape, like, like Robert uh, mentioned too, is like three, four hundred years old here. And so, but many of the Azequias are uh, in, in the place where they were initially built two, three hundred years ago. And people have gradually been adapting uh, the landscape to the vagaries of nature and the shenanigans of of erosion and sedimentation around these Ezekias. Maybe I leave it at that because it's a long story. <laughs> but feel free to give me an email and we can talk more about it. Yeah, thank you. I know it's a, a slightly off topic, but I'm just really fascinated with how old the Ezekias are and just the commitment to maintaining them for so many, you know, for centuries, in spite of uh, all the sedimentation, it's really interesting to me. Yeah, and it, the the other side of it is that uh, there are acequias in other parts of even this valley, but especially other landscapes where they the surrounding landscape has eroded away, and where the uh, acequias are now high and dry above fields, or in other situations where they have become way too low so that actually it, um, you cannot easily pump the water out and flood the fields anymore. So uh, sediment and erosion has definitely played a huge trick on, on the effectiveness of, um, of these acequias. And, and then there's much more to it, in even where they catch their water and 
how the inflow of water in the acequias has been impacted by forest management, erosion, sedimentation, etc. We have a comment. Uh, small drainages might actually be an advantage here because there are fewer people involved. And this was from Isabel um, Jinkas. And she was, she was referring to, it seems like community-based solutions are imperative. Um, so is a comment more than a question. Here's, mm -hmm. Well, I do wanna uh, speak to that. It, it is, uh, uh, true in a way that small drainages are a benefit if actually people can start organizing around them. Some of the small drainages are so close to the roads and the villages that these small drainages, um, well, many of the drainages, but particularly the smaller drainages closer to the village and the road have been impacted so badly by off-road vehicles, uh, by trash dumping, sometimes by development, that actually the runoff in these smaller drainages is very high proportionally. And uh, theoretically that is, you can find that all over the place in the literature too, that these small drainages don't have enough uh, inherent sedimentation areas. They don't have, um, you could say, uh, a large internal conveyance zone where the, the sediment can settle out within the drainage itself. These small drainages actually collect a lot of that and carry it immediately down to the alluvial fans. And so, therefore, we need to be really careful with the smaller areas. Uh, so, and I mentioned last time that if you actually have a choice between big drainages, which we have in this landscape too, for uses of, say, off-road vehicle use, uh, we may eventually want to negotiate with the users of the off-road vehicles to see if we can find a more suitable larger drainage with an in internal buffering system, you could say, by the size and the topography in that drainage, so that the impact of the four-wheel drive uh, areas in this landscape is not weighing so heavily on sedimentation and flesh flooding in the village and the field agricultural part of the valley. Hi, Jan Willem, this is Isabel. <laughs> so it's really Hi, a people Hi, I'm Willem. It's really a people problem then. So um, not just yes. um, a structural problem, which, you know, but the people problem um, almost requires a very different set of skills, right? Well, it's a combination of both because the geophysical, uh, um, you could say, size, dimensions, and et cetera, of, of those small drainages uh, is there. But then if people um, the, the effect of, of impact in them is more acutely felt downstream. So it, in that sense, it is a people problem. Mm -hmm. And so people need to be more aware that these smaller drainages are in that sense more sensitive. Mm -hmm. The fact that they're smaller and closer to the road makes it therefore also possible to heal them. Yeah. And especially if they're also more on private land or especially if these agencies are willing to collaborate where there's multiple jurisdictions owning those drainages. Mm -hmm. So it is a double-edged sword. And um, as you may have seen in some of the projects we've done, we've addressed these small drainages. From a larger watershed perspective, it's not the largest source of sediment uh, or flash flooding. So still from a higher level of observation and strategic planning, we have not chosen to work in those areas. But um, I think for the beginning pilot projects, they are the prime areas to work in. And then over time, when we get more money or when these agencies are willing to work, uh, we should tackle the, the big drainages that uh, provide a lot of sediment and flash flooding to the valley. So it's a, it's a, it's a complex question in terms of planning and with whom you work and at what scale. Yeah, and to address the root causes, basically, right? Exactly, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
but it goes back to my earlier observation as to what your objectives are and what uh, and also who your beneficiaries are who the landowners are and what their needs are and so because we're, we're focusing on this area that you see in this picture here uh, they have immediate landowners downstream that then lead to immediate solutions that you can identify upstream. At a watershed scale, you may prioritize differently. Um, so I, I think it's also important to, to think about scales as a, as a part in the discussion about priorities. There was another question that was typed in and it's from um, Ricardo. I'm composting and would like to get information about incorporating silt using the acequia cleanout material, i.e. optimal ratio of sediment to compost or native soil. Any information sources on this? Well, that's interesting. Uh, typically, you, you wouldn't put any sediment in compost because that makes it very heavy. You want actually to have your compost mix with the dirt on the land itself. So um, to actually mix silt with your compost and then put it down would require that you actually have much heavier and larger equipment to bring down that, you could say, mixed mineralized compost to your field which makes it more costly. And so I am not aware that that is often done. However, it does mean that the compost that you put on the land is being mixed in with your topsoil. And unless you want to compost it and, be and have already some form of um, mixing in place, and that could be if, for instance, it is a field that is full of good lush vegetation, um, or if you have animals working the land from time to time, or if you plow it annually. So then that organic matter is over time getting into the subsoil, and that is fine. Uh, if it's just put on top, then it eventually just uh, will rot, and, and, and uh, the, the fine fibrous material will decompose uh, largely up into the air, and, the, and portions of it by microbial activity will get down into the soil. Uh, it will have served as a cover of, um, of mulch then, and then the mineralized components will eventually uh, get into the soil, but it's a slower process. Um, so working that into the soil in some way, like you do in gardening as well, is, is actually a beneficial process, but um, because I'm not a farmer, and it depends from space, from location to location, what is best. Uh, I would like to ask farmers to tell me what works best here in this landscape. Bounce my, the question back in a way. Is there anybody who knows how how, how would you uh, better incorporate um, compost into the soil, especially here in the Yambudo Valley? What what works best for you? Um, I I could comment on that. I mean, I I don't think I would add. Uh, sediment because I, I live on I live on a kind of the second property down from a big arroyo so I have a lot of alluvial material that have come that has come out over many very very long time uh, that my farm sits on top of I'm nearly uh, six feet higher than the next property next to me and another four feet down to the next property after that uh, so for me, it's all organic material. The most organic material I can get in, the better. And that's, I, I do have some questions about that because I know that Sam Crawford on his farm 
adds quite a bit of wood chips. So I'm very interested in this next presentation to see what, what he says about the quantity of organic material that one might uh, put into the soil. Yeah, I will address that. We asked him that question and um, he definitely needs to plow to bring it under. Uh, he only plows uh, eight to 10 inches, what I remember, is that right, Adrian? And um, and then there is some some handwork that's being done, but yeah, he he needs to bring it under, otherwise it's not effective. I'm seeing that we're about twenty minutes over, so I'm just going to uh, read off um, Ricardo's response, and then Ashley had a comment and then if anyone else, I guess if um, anyone has a question after that to ask it, but I know that we're almost 30 minutes over people's times and we appreciate you sticking with us. There's obviously good um, interaction and, and interest. So Ricardo said, I need to develop an effective consortium to interface with agencies such as NDOT, BLM, and the community, as opposed as to communicating as an individual. So it sounds like he's trying to um, think about this and learn and understand how to address this um, in a larger sense. And then Ashley says, wouldn't the crop make a difference? Stan grows garlic mostly traditionally. There were orchards there, now grapes. Which um, I'm not sure what she was referring to as there, but there aren't grapes at Stan's property, but maybe she's meeting somewhere else in, in the Bosque area. Yeah, sorry. I, um, in, in regards to the correct mulch or the proper kind of mulching, or organic um, um, incorporation, wouldn't it really depend on what the, cro the main crop is that, that you're growing? And I know Stan grows the garlic, but I also know in that area it was traditionally orchards and there's a lot of vineyards or wineries now. So I'm just wondering if, if it would really just depend on what the, the major crop is. Absolutely, Ashley. So on in a, in many orchards, you have a grass cover, and uh, there the uh, sedimentation problem is a, l a little less critical, at least that's what I've seen, um, than, for instance, when you have a row crop. And um, in um, vineyards, it's a little less critical also, uh, is my understanding. But I'd like to hear from people who, who run vineyards and orchards to see how they deal with sediment and what their uh, concerns are. Uh, there it is, I think, often an issue of irrigation, um, uh, that, that your irrigation systems are not clogged or damaged by um, sediment flows, uh, that you have even distribution of water across your orchard and, and vineyard, whereas in uh, fields with row crops, you definitely want to have a much more even distribution and, and work also the organic matter and, and sediment material deeper into the soil, uh, but in such ways that you don't fully destruct, destroy every year the, uh, the, the microbiota that are forming in, in that top soil of the top foot of 12 inches of your, of your soil. And that is also why the healthy soil principles uh, try to tell us to, to minimize soil disturbance because it's been proven that actually, if you uh, rely on uh, resting that soil as much as possible, that actually over time you grow a, a soil microbiota that do nearly all the work. Uh, now with the in interactions of sediment and bringing on organic matter, uh, that is a other situation that falls somewhat out of the conventional ways of, of uh, applications of uh, healthy soil principles. And that's why this is such a, a difficult topic. Uh, but I'd love to talk more with uh, people from uh, the state and, 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 and others involved in that to see what they think uh, would work in those situations.
So I would say if, if people have questions at this point or want to continue a conversation, uh, feel free to uh, send me an email or give me a call. I'm always willing to talk about this stuff. As I mentioned, I'm learning too, and um, uh, it's always a pleasure to learn and share insights. And uh, I think that's the beauty of uh, working with uh, life material like landscapes and ecologies and farms, because there is always a lot to learn. Um, so thank you all for your interest. And uh, if you can join us in two weeks, where we're going to talk about uh, farming and soil health and maintaining soil health in uh, native low and clay soils, where the sedimentation issues are less, but where as a result of farming and land use, we need to maintain healthy soils. And please send us your feedback um, through the uh, link that will be sent to you where you can fill out a brief survey so that we can see what you learned and what feedback you have for us that we can make the next webinar uh, even more effective. Thank you all. And thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to end us now. Have a good rest of your week. Bye-bye.